And we are started. Good afternoon. We're waiting just a moment to let people continue to log on. We've got quite a few on the call today. We want to make sure everybody has a chance to access us by video or audio uh, as much as possible before we begin. So we'll begin in just a moment. Do, 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 do. All right, thank you for allowing us to be with you today. I'm Scott Humphrey, CEO of the World Floor Covering Association, and we're excited to have an opportunity to really bridge the gap today. This is something I've been passionate about for some time, and uh, Robert Barton and I began working on the premise of bridging the gap between professional flooring dealers and professional installers several years ago. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let me first give you an explanation of how this webinar will work. If you have questions that occur or questions that you would like to ask, to one of our panelists or myself during the course of this webinar. If you'll just go down to the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A and enter your question, I will be uh, evaluating that throughout the time as other people are speaking and I will pose your question. If you want it to a specific person, please tell me who the person is you'd like that question to be posed to. If you want it to all panelists, you can say to all panelists and we'll, we, we really want you to drive the Q&A part of this and we know that many of you are really intrigued about what this webinar will be like because because of the title uh, the, the idea that installers finally getting the opportunity to share with retailers things that might simplify both of their lives it might do away with some claims or make life a little bit more profitable on both sides and that's one of the things that we're passionate about as well if you're familiar with these zoom conferences that we've been doing many of them have been about the coronavirus we've been spending a lot of time updating the industry on what's going on with the coronavirus and especially legislation that's happening in DC. We're representing you. We are the voice of the industry as we go to key senators and congressmen and women uh, throughout the United States and tell them what we need in the next wave of legislation that will have a positive impact on small businesses, especially those in the flooring industry. And that's not just uh, retailers, that's also installers, distributors, across the board. It's the reason that we need your voice and it's the reason we're thankful for the increased membership that we have at the WFCA. If you've not seen any kind of press release, just to let you know, we have over 10,000 members now in the WFCA and that helps dramatically when we go to Washington DC and we share with them our needs because they hear you as a vote and that really does make a difference. They're very aware of what their constituents are needing and we, we are the voice that shares that with them. We have a campaign going right now where you can actually go to WFCA.org and you can simply enter your zip code and your name and they will send a letter to your legislators letting them know how you stand on some key issues. The letter is pre-written, you can read that. It's all available to you there. But today's call is different. Uh, today really is a combination of many years of effort and the desire for us all to speak with one voice. So. Robert Varden and I have known each other since we began having talks of WFCA acquiring key assets of CFI, Certified Flooring Installers International. Uh, I will tell you that without the wisdom, the passion and the vision of Jim and Jane Walker and others involved in the start of CFI, we would be so far behind the eight ball that recovery might not be possible. I'm thankful for their vision. I'm thankful for the work that they put in and people like the gentleman that will be in our panel today because they'll share with you how they have been involved in the industry throughout the years helping to promote the profession and they will certainly be a part of what we do going forward to again bridge the gap but also to promote this profession to a new generation coming in to be professional installers craftsmen artisans our panelists today, I'll go through them and as they are on my screen, we have one more who's attempting to join us right now. Uh, he's, he's gonna be calling in, you won't be able to see him. But on my screen, Robert Varden. Uh, Robert is the Executive Director of CFI, Certified Flooring Installers International. Uh, Robert has been in that capacity since before I took on this role and we acquired key assets of CFI. Uh, Robert's a, a great friend, uh, also passionate about making sure that we do all we can, not only for 
professional installers, but the industry as a whole. And he is part of the catalyst for this call today. He has been in the industry and he'll share some of this background with you uh, over 40 years. And so he, he understands what it's like to, to be on your knees, but also to manage those people that are doing that on an ongoing basis. Uh, Dave Garden, a new board member to the WFCA, just so you'll understand the importance of uh, the professional installation field to the WFCA. We have two board positions on the WFCA that are dedicated and committed to CFI installers. And Dave fills one of those positions. Uh, Dave is the um, president of Installation Services LLC and uh, will be a voice for you. So one of the reasons we wanted to have Dave on here is if you have something you want to share with the WFCA related to the topic of installation, Dave is one of the two people you would go through. The other is the person we're trying to get on the phone right now. I'll go ahead and introduce him in case we're able to get him on because he has a vast expertise in this field as well. His name is Tom Cartmel. Uh, Tom is also a WFCA board member representing the CFI, but uh, Tom has been on there for some time. Dave is, is very new in that capacity. Tom has already served one term and is continuing in that role. Uh, Tom is with Diversify, and he will be sharing with you a little bit more about that again if we're able to get our technical difficulties worked out. He has been in the industry since 1975 in a lot of different capacities. One of the reasons we hope to get Tom on is he speaks a little bit of the sales side too because he has been on the sales side uh, commercially, and so he, he speaks not only the installation language but also the sales language. Uh, with that said, maybe a better way to help understand this topic. In 1992, a book was published that uh, said men are from Mars and women are from Venus. It was really about the fact that we often speak different languages. Robert brought this up when we were talking about how to introduce the topic and we, we kind of threw it off, but I really think it says it very well. It, we, we, we're both after the same thing. We both fields want success and professionalism but sometimes the way that we go about communicating that doesn't allow the other side to hear. And we want these webinars to be an opportunity for you to voice concerns, suggestions on topics, things that can make life easier for each side. And that's why this week we have professional installers talking to our professional retailers. And then next week we have a panel of professional flooring dealers that will be giving advice for how they could also help professional installers simplify their lives, be more profitable, and continue on in their relationship with their customer base. So by way of an introduction, that's it. So Robert, I'll go to you first and just let you share a little bit of your background, tell people who you are, uh, how you began, but also what you're doing right now. Um, okay, Scott, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> bottom line is I am, always will be a floor covering professional installer. Uh, 14 years old, uh, my brother grabbed me because he was a floor covering installer and drug me to work. And well, let's just say that was a long time ago, 40 plus years. So obviously just installing every day. Most of that was on the commercial side. Uh, I, I certainly, my bro that, the brother that did that has actually passed away now, but I still thank him for the ethics and the quality of what he did because he instilled that in me. So I've always, you know, as I was installing every day, we kind of always had a motto. Our motto was, you know, with me and my guys is, you know, let, let's do better today than we did yesterday. Because in, in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, it's a competitive field. There's a lot of guys out there. So we want to be able to perform every day to stay ahead of them. And, um, you know, then after installing for years, I then opened up my own workroom. I then employed many installers. Uh, Great guys, uh, the business went very, very well. Ended up actually selling that to another business and then still running it as an installation research and uh, development center, training center. Got involved with CFI, become a trainer. Uh, was very, very involved and just kind of loved what CFI was all about. Because it, it really was about just helping installers improve their skill sets, their professionalism, their business ethics. So the bottom line is so they can learn more and make more monies for their families. That's really what CFI was based on. And so I was very involved with that group, kind of worked my way through that. Uh, did a lot of consulting, troubleshooting. So I've, I've kind of been all over the realm as far as working with flooring. And uh, then of course became CEO slash executive director of CFI. And then WSCA of course was, you know, when we formed the partnership, which was amazing. And, uh, 
currently executive director of CFI. I don't get to train as much as I used to, obviously in this position. I, I love training. I love working with guys. I love, you know, taking a technique that I might have picked up somewhere along the way and, and teaching it to some guy and watching him just kind of light up when the light bulb goes off. And so I just, I do, I just, uh, I love the profession. I hate to call them installers because I think you see from some of our notes, you know, and something that I know we're going to get into this, but you know, it's something that I think retailers need to look at a little differently because the reality is a professional installer is really more of an artisan, you know, and as with all artisans, you know, they have a lot of pride. You know, I've always said, you know, CFI guys and really any professional installer, regardless of whether he's CFI or not, typically that artisan usually brings a big heart, has to do with what they do, how they do it, looking back at a job that they just did. Um, it's an amazing feeling. So, you know, for the retailers that can appreciate that and show that appreciation, oh gosh, you, you just, you just wouldn't believe how far that goes in, in bonding and building a relationship between the two of them. Hey, Robert, Without tell that, me go on. I'm sorry, Scott. Well, some of the areas that you've worked in geographically. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you know, from installing bedrooms in Brussels <laughs> to, <laughs> um, I've really flown all over the world. Um, you know, I, when I started doing some troubleshooting for the manufacturers, that, uh, you know, I was an independent. And, it, and, and, and I say troubleshooting, it was basically, you know, I would go into a situation where maybe some installers were scratching their head and not knowing how to figure out a, a given situation. And I would go in there and I would just work with them side by side and, and we would come up with creative ways to, to make it work. And um, I think that's one thing too about a good professional installer. We, we're very creative. And I think it's that creativity that really, uh, I was just having this conversation with my daughter last night. It's you know, my skill sets are good, but it's the creativity that allows us to do so many different things when you're sitting there scratching your head on how to complete a particular task in installation. But um, so, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've been so blessed in this industry. I mean, I, I can't thank it enough and, and the opportunities I've had because there again, I was actually flown to uh, Brussels to install a bedroom and, and a closet. <laughs> because they were just, it was a very custom material and they were having some problems with it. I've, and again, I've done, you know, training in China, I've done training in uh, Brazil and um, just, yeah, it's just, it's amazing what the, what the industry and what this business has done for me. And I'm at a point in my life where I want to try to give back anything and everything I can. Yeah. And that's a great segue into Dave Garden because Dave is certainly a, a person who likes to give back. Uh, he is part of the WFCA board, Robert, because of your recommendation and because of the reputation he has within CFI. I met Dave the first CFI convention that I went to. He stands out. Dave's just one of those people that he's got this glow about him, and you can tell his passion is not himself. It's in helping other people. Dave, fill us in a little bit. Give us a little bit of your background, how you started, and what you're doing now. Well, Scott, he also stands out because he wears a size 13 shoe. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, yeah, I know I stand out. I'm usually the tallest guy in the room. I got the biggest feet in the room. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as it turns out, um, I like to tell everybody I'm the best looking guy in the room. Uh, knowing, of course, that sometimes I got to stretch the truth a little bit. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> So, so my story with, as, as far as carpet installation goes, I, you know, I got into the trade. I was supposed to go to college, right? I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't college material. I barely made it through high school. Uh, but my parents had big dreams for me and, um, and, and I was unable to fulfill those dreams. What, what I did, what I did though, was when I got into business and I started off right, right out, out of high school. And I ended up with my own van and tools. By the time I was 18 years old, I had, I, was, I had my own business. I had no clue what I was doing. Absolutely no clue what I was doing. I, 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 got, I worked for a shop that, uh, um, gosh, they had 100 installers show up every day. Great shop to work for. Um, at least I thought at the time it was a great shop to work for. Uh, I'm not so sure why they'd ever hire a guy that was 18 years old and had no idea what seam sealer was. <laughs> but they did. Uh, but they did. Uh, I, I, I was retrained by, by 
a guy that to this day I got to call up every other month or so and just thank him for for what he's provided me. And it, it I learned more on the truck, more in the truck on the way to the job than I than I did the first two or three years I was in the trade. And it's just it's just amazing. So basically, what what he told me, and and he's a ex marine and um, ex marine and uh, an elder at his church, <laughs> but. What he told me was to make sure I passed it along, right? And he said he's given me a, a Viking certified installation class every day. And, and some of the people on this phone probably uh, have heard of Viking certified car or Viking carpets. Um, I'll tell you this, if you're old enough to have installed them, you should be retired. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, here I am. So, so but th this many years forward, I, 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 I've worked for that shop and I would still be working for that shop had they not gone out of business. And they, they went out of business. I thought I had a job there for my entire life. But what happened was after they went out of business, thank goodness I got involved with CFI because I learned, I, I, I learned so much. My first CFI training I went to, I, I was sure I'd be the best installer there, but I wanted to make sure I was the best installer there, which is why I went. More of a competitive thing than anything else. I, I I was so humiliated, <laughs> not 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 by the other students, mind you, but but by the by the trainers. The trainers were so much better than I ever dreamed I could be. I wanted to be one of them. I, I it wasn't it wasn't uh, even about being one of them. I wanted to be better than they were, and and it's you just get this competitive spirit that flows out. And um, those guys to this day, I know Jim Walker, you know Tom Cartmel, who should be on this call. <laughs> as a, as there and, and and I so I, I strive for that. When I got involved with training, I strive for that every day. It was to put on the same show that Jim could put on, right? Uh, and to be the same, to be the same inspiration that Tom actually was to me, and Tom was, and Tom was. Tom challenged me seriously that day, and and he made me better. So by the time I left this certification, I was a better installer. Uh, I was a better installer. So I, I learned a ton. But putting that to putting that application to everyday use was a little bit more difficult, because you know here I go back to work. I'm not making any more money than I was before, not understanding that I needed to learn how to uh, process the information that I gained and and repackage it to to resell myself to the people I work for. Mm -hmm. As it turns out, they went out of business, <laughs> and and I ended up found myself working for somebody else. I'm seeing a pattern here, Dave. What's that? You're seeing a pattern of places you work for going out of business. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's tough because, you know, here's the thing is at the end of the day, I, I ended up getting paid more than other installers. And I didn't, I never realized that I was. Uh, the one place that went out of business, when they were going out of business, we, we uh, uh, as I was getting my check, a guy told me that the next week he could no longer pay me my, my premium fee. I said, what do you mean premium fee? So you've been you've been getting a premium fee for two years. Wow. I, I said, I said, what are you talking about? And he showed me my rates and he showed me the rates of, that he says, he says, hey, haven't you ever discussed this? And I said, no, you told me not to discuss my rates. Why would I discuss my rates? <laughs> so so I, I had no idea I was making that much more than the other installers. But they knew what they had. And you know, that they had somebody who's gonna be extremely loyal. I was going to make them money every day. I mean, and I, and I did, I made them money by, by the work I provided and by the attitude I provided on the job site. And so by doing that, they knew they didn't want to lose me. Well, and they also probably, Dave, didn't have to worry about business coming back at them because of some type of fault during the installation. Well, I wasn't perfect, but uh, yeah, there were, there, were, there, there was always going to be mistakes. But when that business did come back, we were out there the next day making sure that business, that, that, that business returned to get more. That's cool. I mean, we, we really put a, a strong emphasis and to this day. So fast forward to today, I ended up having to start my own company because the last company I worked for that went out of business, well, I, I had nothing to do and I owed a lot of money. So I ended up starting my own company and, and uh, I'm not saying it's been bottoms up ever since. There's a lot of work and a lot of, a lot of learning went on. But this, this many years later, we're still going strong and we're growing. And, and we're growing because of the service. It, it, not, so much, not so much the installation habits, which is hard to say as an installer. 
<laughs> because because we all want to brag about our installs. But at the end of the day, it's how we service that customer that sets us apart. And and that's and that's why we grow. So that's that's my story. It's not as long as Robert's. I, the only Brussels I ever saw came in a sprout. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's a, I'm, I'm I'm from Detroit, and and I, I love I love where I live, and um and and not that I don't hope to move to Florida like everybody else in Detroit does at some point, but I understand this. I'm in no rush to get there. <laughs> hey Dave, a couple of questions. First of all, you're still in the Detroit area. Is that where you did all of your work throughout your career? Basically, yeah. Now we go all throughout Michigan, northern Indiana, and northern Ohio. But uh, but our base our base is Detroit. I, I live right now four miles from where I grew up. Wait, no, three miles from where I grew up. And uh, so it, it, it's been good to me. <laughs> Dave, I know a lot of people get into this because an uncle, a brother, somebody else was in it, as Robert mentioned, his brother. Was there something that made the flooring industry the thing that you went to? Yeah, I had an uncle. I, I had an uncle, and when I told my dad I wasn't going to college, he called up my uncle, said, I got one for you. The first week, they put me on a crew with somebody else who was the best guy at that shop at the time. Um, and, and they sent us to a place called Highland Park mm. for the next week. And if anybody knows Detroit, they know Highland Park is probably the roughest area. And, and their goal was to scare me back into college. Didn't work. Didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, guys, I, th I assume, Lewis, we're going to go forward without Tom. We weren't able to get the audio worked out. Okay. Anyway, guys, we'll get we'll – yeah, he, he just messaged me, Scott, and, uh, and gave an apology. Yeah. Uh, and I tell you, one of the reasons why I picked Tom is I've known Tom for, for many, many years. And not only did I respect Tom because, for his installation abilities, because when I met Tom, you know, he was an installer. Um, but Tom, like – several of us, as, as you've just heard from myself and even from Dave, you know, started out on his knees, had a lot of pride in what he did, uh, became a phenomenal installer, so much so that actually Mohawk then sought him out to be a technical guy for Mohawk. So then he actually went in and was a tech person for Mohawk for several years, went out of that, and then actually opened up an installation company. So he and I, that's why we had a lot of, a lot of parallels. Uh, we were both troubleshooting. We both then ended up installation companies. But then Tom upped me one. Well, maybe I upped him one. I went to CFI. He started, he went with Diversified. Uh, but even before Diversified, he worked for a very large company out of Indianapolis. You may know him called the Lakeleys. But he was in sales. So, you know, he's he's got a very rounded, you know, and, and it's a shame he can't be on here because, you know, both of us come from the commercial side. But with his knowledge of both, you know, kind of the install side and the sales side, that's why we picked him. And uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. And he's, he just said in this message, he's very sorry he couldn't attend. No, that's all right. We'll get him back on another time. I wanted him on because I wanted to, to recognize him as the president of the I Married Over My Head Club. <laughs> yeah, it's for his, sure. <laughs> his wife, Karen. You know, you know Tom and Karen. You know exactly what Scott's talking about. Yeah, he, he's proud of that, though. So that's good. I'm, everybody <coughs> loves themselves. So guys, let's get to the meat of this. If, uh, if there were a piece of advice that you would offer to professional flooring dealers that might simplify their life as it relates to the installation side, might make them more profitable, might remove some headaches. Dave, what would that advice be? And it might be multiple pieces of advice. And I've got some questions coming in. Let me remind those that are watching. If you've got questions, go to the bottom of the screen where it says Q&A. Jot in your question, and when we go through a couple of these preliminary questions, I'll, I'll, we'll begin to answer the questions that you've sent us. Dave? Um, you're going to have to repeat the question because I've been listening. Yeah, so, so Dave, just simply, what, what advice would you give to a professional flooring dealer on the retail side? And simply, what would you say to them that they could do in relation to installation that would make their life easier? Make sure they get to know their installers personally. Um, you want to know, and I tell my installers the same thing. You want to know the salespeople personally. You want to you want to build a relationship with them because the better that relationship is with the individuals inside the store, the better you can sell each other. Also, the better you can communicate something to each other if it's not going as well as you would appreciate it to go. Yeah. But uh, it all starts with that relationship. Get to know your installers. Dave, were you ever an employee of of a, a professional flooring dealer, or you were always subcontract? I've been a contractor since eighteen years old. 
Okay, so I was going to ask the difference maybe. What about you, Robert? Did you ever have a time that you worked for an entity? You know, 40 plus years, I got to think about that. Uh, <laughs> Um, not as an installer. Well, no, well, not really. I've, I've pretty much been an independent contractor. Only reason why I paused is I went into work, uh, for a very, very large MSA industries, uh, union shop, but they still kind of had worked it out to where I was on the payroll, but I was on a, under a bonus structure that still was tied to a per square foot and per yard basis. And that's what, that's when you're in Northern California. Correct. Okay. All right. Now so, I have, I've, I have had a, some employees work for me as installers. Okay. All right. Uh, so speak to I that could, day because that's where I think the relationship is important. It's one thing to work for an entity. It's another to work for an individual. And you're right. The more you know that person, the more you feel like you're personally failing them or letting them down if the relationship's important. And that's one thing professional foreign dealers need to understand. There's a reason to invest in that relationship because you want them to feel like you're, you're counting on them. They, they are doing a job and a duty for you. I always say that basically the salesperson sells the canvas and the paint, but the masterpiece is created by the installer. They're the one that paints the picture that gets looked at every day. And so it is that intricate a partnership. It's important that both are working together. And the installer is gonna say they want the right color paint. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> there you go. But. Uh, uh, yeah, so so the guys that I had working as employees, they were always jealous of the contractors. And they never quite understood how good they had it as employees until they left and went to contracting. And, you know, it's See, easy. The difference between the two. So from, from a, an installation standpoint, why is it important to, to consider being an employee versus being a, a contractor? Well, my, well, if you're an employee, you're getting your van, your van's taken care of, your, so your ride's taken care of, your tools are taken care of. For us, we had health insurance for the guys. You know, you know we, we had all of that rolled in, but, the, but they were getting an hourly rate. And so what they were seeing was, that what they were seeing was uh, installers coming in alongside them that were contractors that were pulling a much larger check. And what they didn't understand is what that check was going to. And, and, and really, now, now here's the thing about all that, because if I was an employee of that first company, I never would have grown into who I am today. But you know what? What I'm doing isn't for everybody. So we, we all have to find out where we fit in, in the industry and then work forward from there. And maybe that changes. You know, maybe if I was an employee, maybe I would have went to him by the time I was 25 years old and said, look, I want to, I want a contract now. And here's the reasons why, because uh, uh, the other thing that, about this is the employees that I had, I did not want to see them go out on their own as contractors. And the reason was, is because I didn't want them to make the same mistakes I made, mm. you know, because those first couple of years, I did not pay my taxes. You know, I, I was, I was uh, smart enough to file them. I was not, 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 not bright enough to write checks though, you know, and, and, and you were like and, most installers in the industry at the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I didn't, I didn't catch wind until I wanted to buy a house. You know, I got a young kid at home. I got, you know, a beautiful wife and I, want, I need to keep her happy. And I need to, I need to put him in a, in, in an area in a school that, uh, that, that would benefit his education. And I couldn't afford a house because I owed the government a ton of money. Right. So we had to pay the government off first. And, and, and here's something else that wasn't smart enough. I, I wasn't smart enough to go make a deal with the government. I just paid them off. Ooh. So, Ooh. so, but we took care of our debts. Uh, we took care of our debts and, you know, and, and uh, a, a short couple of years later, here I am, yeah. you know, a, a couple of houses later and, and um, it, in, with a good credit score. Why? Because we, we learned how to take care of that. But if I wasn't, if I was working as an employee when I was younger, I, I would have missed that part of it. Yeah. And by the time I started contracting, I would have been ready to start contracting. So instead what we have is guys out there that are contracting that don't understand what their responsibilities are. And then when it comes time for them that they need to become an employee, and here's the, here's the harsh part about our trade. So, so we have a carpet store that wants to hire an installer as a, as a salesperson because he's fantastic, right? 
Then they go put him all through this. He's working for two months and they get a letter from the IRS stating they got to take his paycheck. They put all that training into somebody and he hasn't paid his taxes for 20 years. That's a harsh reality is something that actually happens in our industry to somebody every day. And I really wanted those kids that went through our school to understand, to understand that before they went out on their own. Uh, like I said, that did not happen because they, 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 I don't own anybody and nobody's an indentured servant. They have, they have the ability to think for themselves. And they looked at the same thing I looked at when I was 19 years old. I looked at uh, the fact that I was pulling down $1,100. Uh, I get $1,100 in a paycheck. I give 300 of that to my help. 200 went to gas or gas supplies and all that stuff. And then I'm looking at myself, I've got what, $500 left in cash. Wow. Well, we, yeah, you should never give a 19 year old $500 of cash. Not, <laughs> not even today. <laughs> not a wise idea. Yeah. So I ended up, I ended up in a, digging myself a huge hole. And, and so that's the difference, by the way. It, you, it, took negative, might, you took that negative and turned it into a positive. So you're saying you're glad it worked out the way it did, even though it was painful at the time. But that's what opened the door for you to be your own boss. That's right. But we have to know when the time is to do that. Yeah. Um, I've got guys that, that I know that are fantastic installers. They can't work for me. They can't even contract for me. Why? Because, because either they, they owe the IRS too much money, and I'll get that letter, or I can't pay them what they're physically worth. And they're willing to go out and spend spend the the, the dime and the time, right? Out out hustling that workout. And and that and, and I and I commend those guys. That's a different business model than what I have, right? Um, I d I don't have to do that and I don't and none of my guys have to do that. But we do with the, the contractors, we make sure that we call them contractors. I don't call them artisans, I don't call them installers. The reason I like calling them contractors is they have to understand that they have choices. They, they have to understand they have choices and contractors have choices. Yeah. So I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. No, no, that's good. <laughs> so what are the, let me give something that I know will have some impact to everybody that's listening on the professional foreign dealer side. If you were a professional foreign dealer right now and you were needing help, you needed professional installers, where are the places you would look? And I think that's a common need right now. Where are the places you would go? Is this to me? Either one of you. Well, if I were if I were a if I were a dealer right now, or excuse me, a, a, a carpet store, and and, and uh, we'll, we'll you know, use any uh, plug any name in, I would make sure that I had a good relationship with the sundry houses. For when that installer comes in all upset, that mm -hmm. that my number gets handed out. I'm I'm not saying I don't do that. I'm not saying I do either, I guess, but, uh, but you, you have to know who your friends are. Right. And if you're buying, if you're buying, uh, these stores, we buy their adhesives from somebody and I would make sure I build a relationship with that somebody because, because at the end of the day, you, the Craigslist doesn't work. Let's face it. Uh, Craigslist doesn't work. And, and I can remember back in the eighties, and just hiring somebody, you put an ad in the paper and, and you'd have 50, 60 calls in an hour, right? Well, well you're lucky to get that in a week now. Um, you go to Indeed, which is another place you to, to hire people. Unfortunately for labor, that doesn't really work that well. It, it, uh, uh, we've tried it, it doesn't work out well at all. Yeah. Um, best way to do it is by making sure that you have a great relationship with your installer because they are your best word of mouth because they go to that sundry store themselves. They pick up their blades or staples, uh, their tax strip, whatever it is they have to pick up during that sundry store. And if they're happy with what they're doing with you, they're gonna bring somebody else along when they hear them whining inside the shop. Yeah, uh, and, and that does happen, and that does happen. I, and I gotta say that's worked for us. Uh, that's, worked, that's worked wonders for us. It's just our guys will bring us somebody else. Hey, yeah. Jay, Tom, I, you know, I, I, I know him, I've known him for the last four years and we see each other all the time. We, we think he'd be a great fit here, you know? And, and so your installers are your absolute best advertisers. 
Yeah, we call them the walking billboard because they're the ones that they're going to be telling people whether you treat them right. <clears throat> they're going to be telling people whether you treat them wrong. If you're simply a job to them, something they have to do because they need a paycheck, then they're not advertising for you the way that you want them to. But if you're treating them right, if you're paying them better because they're certified, you're paying them better because they do a better job, if you're loyal to them, if you're understanding when they need time off, those type of things, then they'll go out and advertise for you. And they're, the good thing about them is they're always looking. They're not just looking when you say you have a need. They're always looking for people that they may bring in to, to be helpers or to work within the industry. What about you, Robert? I know that we, we have this talk a lot because we're constantly looking for new blood in the industry. But if you were a professional flooring dealer and you needed somebody today, where, where would you go? Where would you look? Well, I guess you'd have to define today. I mean, if I've got a job that needs installed next week, then yeah, the bottom line is in the, in the state of the industry right now, the only place I'm going to find them, one that's worth hiring, in my opinion, is I'm going to have to steal him from somebody else. That's right. You're, you're looking whether at it. Whether it be a workroom, whether it be whatever venue you find a stealing, that's the only place you're going to find him. But if I could, if I could get things covered, even if, even if I'm backed up a bit, and I'm thinking the future of my business. Yeah, investment then I, what I would be looking for is I'd be looking for young kids. I'd put them through a phenomenal interview process. Uh, you know, I would put them into situations where I can kind of, because you've got to get a good sense of the individual first. Maybe I'm putting them in my warehouse, maybe do something. And, and then I would put them into training because unfortunately our industry right now is full of a lot of installers that I don't know. I, I'm going to try to be nice, but the bottom line is, you know, between a thousand dollars between their trucks and tools and van, you know, suddenly overnight they became a flooring installer mm -hmm. because of the desperate need that so many retailers have. They're hiring people that I would not consider a professional flooring installer, yeah, you know? Uh, <laughs> so, so yeah, if I, I would be thinking more of the future of my business. I'd look at recruiting. I'd look at uh, in-house training. I would look at, because there again, there's some great, training entities i'm not here to just push cfi although we are a phenomenal training entity but um you know there's training out there for these guys these kids to have so that's that's probably where i'd be looking i'd be looking at recruiting the youth because unfortunately you know the age of our installers now even if i found one today chances are he's in his 50s or older and i've got to start thinking of my future because obviously as a as a business owner you want your, you, you know, you want your business to grow and continue. Um, you know, you, you'd said earlier too, something as far as, and I think maybe I read it in the questionnaires, you know, some of the biggest hurdles and, and Dave, you, you could have probably have kept, just had one of us on here because as I'm listening to Dave, so many of the things I would just repeat because I've said it so many times about, and it's not just obtaining installers. It's not just trying to minimize your issues, your conflicts, your, you know, and by that, I mean, with your consumer, with your end user, but it's also, it's getting installers, retaining installers. All of that comes down to the relationships you have with your installers. If you're looking at your installers as a cost of doing business, chances are you're not going to be too successful. If you're looking at your installers as a partnership, then what I would suggest is that you get to know them more about how they do, what they do, you know, and I got to tell you, in all my 40 plus years of doing business, um, you know, I, I can sit and brag and say how great we were, and, and we were, <laughs> and we did a lot of work, we did a lot of phenomenal jobs, and when I say, you know, again, this industry has blessed me, we, you know, 33,000 yards at San Francisco International Airport, you know, I mean, just m huge projects that people think about, and it's, you know, so when I look at those things, <clears throat> the replenishment of that, that's a lot of guys. That's a lot of training. It's a lot of people. But, you know, I, I guess I can't, and I kind of got off topic right there, but the, how you treat your installers, for instance, you know, I, in fact, I did a seminar, I think, uh, I don't know, CCA or whatever, had a bunch of retailers in the room and, and it was kind of on the same topic. So one of my first questions were, you know, it was right after Christmas, I think it was January, February. And so I asked the retailers, you know, you know, we just got past the holidays. How many of you had a Christmas party? You know, a bunch of hands go up. Next question was, how many of you invited your installation staff to your Christmas party? Not even half the hands went up. <laughs> you know, 
my guys, when I had my workroom, all of my installers worked for me by the hour. Now, of course, they had a great pay. We had a bonus structure. They had benefits. They, you know, vacation. But, you know, we did summer picnics. We did, you know, appreciation breakfasts where I would actually have the sales staff that we did work for. It was a big outfit, MSA Industries in Northern California. Those salespeople would come over and actually cook breakfast on these griddles out in the warehouse for the installers. What better way for them to get to know each other? Because if you don't, yeah, that's a great if you don't know who you're working for, if you can put a face to that salesperson, then I, I guarantee it. Oh yeah, I remember John. That's right. Oh, John did. Well, let me call John. You know, rather than sitting there saying, oh yeah, John did this. Because too many times I find that the, the sales staff, we'll just call it the salesman, retailer, dealer, whatever. The salesperson and the installers kind of want to be on their two planes. And if they can get out of something and blame it on the other, well, then many a times they do that. Well, you know, be it the end user, be it the consumer, they only see one. They see the company that they wrote the check to. They could care less if you're a subcontractor, you're an employee, what have you. All they care about is getting the job done. So if you got two people that are just pointing fingers at each other, it's just a recipe for disaster. Yeah, and Robert, I would think that if you're a, if you're a salesperson and you can look at the consumer and say, listen, on this job, I'll get Robert for you. Build some confidence into the consumer that you have a first name relationship with the installer and that you're willing to put your confidence behind them. I mean, that, what a better way to close the sale than to know the quality of workmanship that's going to put the product in. Well, and, and you know, even in some of the notes that I put that, that I did for this, you know, one of them was, you know, how many, re how many retailers actually brag about their installers? Mm. Not just brag on them, but say, yeah, you know, by the way, you know, we have Dave Garden, who's going to come to your house tomorrow night. And Dave is CFI certified. He's a Master 2 certified guy. Mm -hmm. uh, I really think you're going to like him. He's a wonderful guy. And then Dave, on the other hand, should be doing the same thing. Well, you know, your salesperson, Lewis, oh, he's, he's phenomenal. He's, he's a great guy. You know, and even if an issue comes up, you know, you know what? I would call Lewis. You know, Lewis will probably, you know, be able to take care of you there. That's not really something I would take care of. But I tell you, the more the team works together, um, it, it just – it bar none is probably if somebody if I had to say just one statement to a retailer and to an installer to be to satisfy obviously the ultimate goal is to satisfy the end user the consumer the dealer uh, the GC or regardless of where you're at um, that's what I'd say now the recipe for that is a ton of little things you know I did a lot of commercial work so on the commercial side you know, I used to think, you know, did the salesman call the GC at all to ask him if this job was ready? Did he communicate at all that, you know, that the trades needed to be out of the way? I mean, so there again, there's, and, you know, and on the residential side, because, you know, again, my workroom, we had a residential division and a commercial division. And, and there it comes down to, you know, oh my gosh, did the salesperson walk this job with the consumer at all? Did they take in a checklist? Did they walk through and say, yeah, that giant antique that's 10 foot wide and 10 foot tall. My installers won't be able to move that. You'll have to hire somebody. No, they don't. The installers get out there and they're looking at it, scratching their head and the liability sudden, because you got a consumer who wants her carpet in. She don't care. Nobody told her she was supposed to move it. So much I tell you, it comes back to the communication. So much of it comes does, back to that. It does. I can't tell you how many times. The lack of communication. How many times it's been a beautiful material, a beautiful sale, got a great installer, but these tiny little things, it's the, it's, it's the 2%. That's what I've always said. It's the 2% of items that didn't get communicated, didn't go over, that suddenly the installer's out there. And believe me, we're not perfect. We, we can improve it. And, and by the way, I want to thank you for kind of doing this segment because I certainly hope that the retailer gets some stuff out of it. And I'm hoping next week that the installers attend to see just what the retailers have to say that we can get out of it as installers, yeah. because it's gotta be a, a two way street. It really does. I rambled on you. Sorry. <laughs> hey, no, that's all right. I've got five questions. So we're sure that we get to the questions that people have submitted. Dave, one of them is people want to know how to best contact you. Um, uh, because we shared with them that you're a representative of uh, installation on the WSCA board. What's the best email address for them to contact you if they have a question or comment? All right. Um, well, D A V E, Dave, and get ready to write at C F I Master Installer Mail dot com. Spell, spell mail M A L E. 
Um, M-A-I-L. Okay, masterinstaller, M-A-I-L.com. That's correct. Okay. That's and we'll, correct. Guys, we'll, we'll try to post that when we post the uh, information about how you can rewatch this. Uh, Dave, they also wanted to know who you worked for. Oh, you want a list? Well, just a couple of the more recent ones. I broke in at New York Carpet World. Okay. I learned how to install carpet at a guy uh, from a guy named Bob Trudell. Uh, Bob Trudell uh, was a, a local guy in our community that, uh, fantastic guy, absolutely fantastic. He taught me about the business end. But the guy that really taught me how to understand what carpet was, his name was Tom Hurt, uh, Tom Hurt, Tom Hurt. Uh, fantastic guy. Again, uh, Tom, Tom taught me more about how to live my life than he did actually, and he's the one that originally showed me how to hand sew. But while he was showing me how to hand sew, it was almost like a second dad to me. So it, um, it, it, uh, we can only hope we impact each other the way he impacted me. Yeah, I love the premise that you laid out, Dave, when we were having this conversation before everybody came on of really paying it forward. That the reason right. this, and, and Robert, the reason you're motivated to continue to do this when you really don't have to anymore is it's our chance to give back to an industry that's been really good to all of us and to impact as many individual lives as possible. And that's, that's really the goal and what drives us. Uh, this is a great question. It was the very first question that was asked. Uh, it says, what do you find is the biggest hurdle installers have when dealing with the retailers that they're working for? I know we've talked around that issue, but if you were to single out one big issue that installers have with the retailers they work for, what, what would it be? And is it something that retailers can fix? Well, See, that's going to all be fixed. <laughs> You got something, Robert? Go ahead. No, I was, it, it, it encompasses a lot of things, but the biggest thing is communication. Yeah. yeah. Communication and preparation. I mean, I know we're not lawyers, and so we don't need that much preparation, but I tell you, it's, it's amazing how, you know, with the, with the sell side, and again, whether it's retail or dealer, with the sell side versus the install side, you know, there's a point where that, that baton has to be handed off to the installer. Well, if, if, if you don't hand me everything I need to be successful for you, then, then something's inevitably going to happen. I mean, the chances of it happen. So the communication and the relationship is so, I mean, just, it's, it's, it's elementary. It's, it's, it's so important. Yeah, and, you, and there again, you know, check off lists, walkthroughs, communication with the consumer that they're ready. They ever, I mean, it's just, you know, and these, there's even a lot of little things, and I'll let Dave jump in here as too, is, you know, we would obviously, <clears throat> you know, in today's world, especially the COVID world, but, you know, mm. everybody's time is valuable anymore. And so, you know, it, we would certainly, as installers, respect the retailer's time. They've only got so much time to sell and be with their family and so forth. We would also like that same respect. You know, sometimes, you know, and Dave would probably say this, as an installer, you know, I get to the workroom that I'm going to take a job out that day, and they're still writing up paperwork, and none of the materials pulled, and suddenly I'm an hour and a half just waiting for my job. You know, that's an hour, now I'm in, I mean, so like I said, there's so many little things that if we really communicated with each other, and, and that's what I would advise every retailer on here, and every installer on here, if from this webinar, this doesn't at least make you want to communicate together to where you're face to face with each other and, 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 and start creating that bond if you don't have it already, because it will do worlds for both of you, both the installer and the retailer. Yeah. Dave, what you got on that one? Uh, Robert was hitting. Robert was hitting. It. There's a couple of things, right? The first thing is we can never pay a guy what he's worth. We most certainly can't pay him what he believes he's worth. Uh, now, granted, the pay should be better for installers, and we'll harp on that over and over again. As installers, we'll always ask for more. Uh, what stops us from delivering that more, though? Back to back to the uh, the stores we work for, the the shops we work for, is that preparation end. I mean, that that's in our way all the time. If if you have uh, as an installer, what I want is a clean work order. Let me know exactly what's going on in that household. So when I call the customer on my way, 
I, I have a good conversation with her about what's going to happen when I get there. All right. If, if, I, if I work for a shop that cuts the carpet, I want my cuts right. If I work for a shop that doesn't cut the carpet, well, that, that's, that's fine too, but I want that carpet and padding ready for me so that I can load and go. If I work for a shop that supplies tax strip, I want that tax strip right there. If I work for a shop that doesn't supply tax strip, I want to know if I need tax strip before I get to the job site. Yeah. All these little things work. I and mean, you can do it any way you want to do it. If, if you could supply something or you decide not to supply something, either way, that installer needs to know everything that's going to happen on that job site. And I like to call them surprises. We don't like to be surprised inherently. We don't like to be surprised. Not, not at work, man. It's not a birthday. You know, it, uh, uh, we, we want to know exactly what's going on. And I know myself, when I was installing every day, I, I would have, I would look at my work order and I would know exactly where I was going to be on that job site at what part of the day. Mm. And, and, and therefore I knew if I was either falling behind or not doing something, because it was all about money to me. Right. And, and not, that wasn't trying to take care of the customers, but I had a family at home. You know, I, I had a family at home. And one thing that, that breaks us down with stores, you know, and I've worked for a few small stores that uh, everybody seemed to be a, a relative of the owner. You know, everybody seemed to be a relative of the owner. I'd say, you know, we need a favor today. We need you to move this refrigerator or we need you to move this. And, and those favors all take money off the table. They all take food off the table. And so I was, I, I would always hold, and I would always hold a ledger exactly how much steam tape I was using every day, what I was using tax strip. I want to know exactly what I spent, but I also wanted to know what I was making. So at the end of every day, I knew where I stood. I knew whether I needed to pull out an extra 30 yards when I go into the shop the next day, hey man, am I might throw in a bedroom on the end of my day or, or, or what be it. But I knew where I stood and I, I knew therefore where I needed to be and if I didn't, what would happen when I get to the job site? So now a job that, that I thought would have taken, you know, seven hours to do. Now, if I get surprised and I have to take apart some furniture, and, and here's where we as installers aren't all that bright. Most of the time, we're just going to take apart that furniture because we can't afford to lose a day's labor. But we're also, what we're doing is we're breaking our bodies down to the point where we can't perform the same job the next day as we get older you know I'm, 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 most of most of my installers are no longer in their 20s and 30s most of them are a little bit older and if i can't give them a work order that fits them then i'm failing them uh, then i'm failing them and, and it's all about that communication it, it really is and you need to make sure that that stuff is tight for that installer um so that if, if you're talking myself if i'm going to work today and i say my wife comes to me and says, you know what, Dave, I got this great job opportunity. We're moving to Kansas City, right? Well, what would I do? I'm not going to go move to Kansas City with my wife. <laughs> I need her. You know, so <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, as, as I was going to look for work in Kansas City, there would be things that I would be expecting out of that shop. And the talk wouldn't so much be about money. Don't get me wrong. That, that, that talk would be there as well. But it would be more about how they set up their installs, how they set, how, how I'm getting set up, where I'm going to have to drive, um, what, what would be the uh, protocol when I do have to drive two hours, you know, the, that sort of thing. I'd want to know all those things, not so much the pay, because the pay is going to be pretty standard at pretty much every shop. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I'll, I'll, I'll ask. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, I want to know about that work order more than anything else. Good. So let me, let me kind of synopsize this. So here's what I've heard so far. The importance of relationships, getting to know the other side, going across the bridge and shaking hands with the other side. The importance of communication at every level. Communication to the customer, communication to the installer, communication to the sales force, communication to the owner, across the board, improving communication. And then as Dave just said, the devil's in the details. The more of those details that are ironed out ahead of time and communicated correctly, the less surprises and surprises in the end cost money because they cost us time. So I'm going to jump ahead and I need uh, uh, guys, I need you to kind of make your answers short because I got more questions than I expected here at the end. And I want to make sure we get to all of them. Um, 
Daniel Gonzalez said, you're talking about dealers finding installers, but the answers point to hiring installers as employees. Most dealers only use contractors. So these answers point to us contractors and not to dealers in my opinion. So he's saying that, that in his mind, the answers lie with, with hiring employees and that's a whole different webinar, but I want to let you know that that thought is out there and we do communicate that a lot. The importance, even at the beginning of this, Dave talking about the difference in, in how something would have turned out if it was an employee versus a subcontractor. Here's one from uh, Andrea O'Connell. She says, you talk about training, but I haven't seen any training opportunities, even in my entire state, let alone my community. What do you suggest for training? She says she's in Colorado. So uh, I know that we have training. I know in th th there are union-based training programs. Uh, Robert, very quickly, what would you suggest to somebody who wants to find out what training is available out there? Well, I mean, depending on what type of training she's looking for. I mean, obviously, CFI trains in every category of flooring, wood, resilient, carpet, tile. We also train all over the country, all over the world. We have schools in China and so forth. Um, and, and there's also other great training entities, MWFA, if they're, if they're want to be specific with wood. Uh, there's the NTCA that's specific on tile. So, you know, there are some phenomenal training groups yeah. out there. It's just a matter of seeking them. And, and, you know, even if somebody wanted information on the NWFA that's listening to this call, obviously, I think you can just look it up by punching NWFA. But if you want to call us here, we'll gladly give you their information. We have a great relationship with all those other training entities. Yeah, that's a great point, Rob. We really have sought to work together with all the other associations, <clears throat> training entities, to make sure that we're providing solutions to you. We found that a lot of times we were duplicating work. We were doing the same thing, but we didn't know it because, again, same advice we're giving you between retailer and installer is the communication wasn't taking place. But yes, if you have a question about any training, whether it's product specific or not, go to Robert. He can get you the answer if he doesn't have the answer already, and we will steer you in the right direction. And one, one real quick comment I want to throw out there, Scott, and I know we're short on time is, you know, it's CFI, kind of like I said in the beginning, our goal is to train and educate so you can go out and make a good living for your families. You know, we talked earlier about you asked, you know, being independent versus employees. All my guys were employees. I had a couple of guys that were mechanics that were phenomenal mechanics. They could have easily went out and been a contractor. But you know what? That just wasn't their that's what, number one, you know, they wanted to, some guys just want to go work hard eight hours, go home, forget about it, drink a beer and, you know, enjoy life and get a paycheck every Friday. That's what they live for. Other guys, and one thing, and the reason this is a comment I wanted to make is that at CFI, we really want to give them all those opportunities. You know, we're working with the, with the unions, with IUPAT, which is a phenomenal group. You know, and there again, when we get a young kid that comes in and wants to take on this trade, we want to make sure that he or she knows all of the different avenues in this industry that they can pursue. Some of them might want to be an IC. Some of them might want to be an hourly employee. Some of them might want to join the union. There's so many opportunities for kids in this industry. And it's also an industry that I can almost do anything in this industry. I mean, how many industries can I go in it? And if I want to six months a year, I can own my own business. Yeah. Installation is built that way. Sorry. Okay. No, that, but it's a good point, Robert. We have done a terrible job of telling that story. So let me get a couple other things here. Uh, we Anonymous sent in this response, eliminate surprises by allowing installers to see jobs prior to the morning of the install. When possible, certainly would eliminate a lot of those surprises. Uh, very quickly, one last question, and then I'm going to answer a question that's been asked here of what the WFCA is doing to direct information to young people to get them to come into the trade. But one last question for the two of you, pretty tight answers because we're already past time. How does the COVID situation impact installer at the job site? Dave, you go first real quick. That makes life rough, let me tell you. Um, uh, we, we live in this great state of Michigan here that uh, uh, we, we, we've dealt with COVID differently than other states. But uh, we actually, what we want our installers to do when they walk in the door, anytime they're wrong, customer they need to have mask on realistically they can't wear mask all day all right they, 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 they work especially during the summer it's hot it's harder to breathe get it we ask that the customer wear a mask as well when we get to the job site why because my installers have health concerns they got families and and to top things off we ask that the customer leave the area when we're installing 
And the cool thing about that now is, is we have a situation that we've wanted for a long time is to get left alone, right? And let us install. And now, now we actually were able to create that. Of course, it does create some distance with the, with the customers, but there is time for that. Uh, so it's very important. The other thing that we've been asking our, that our customers do, we've really been driving home that, that we cannot move knickknacks. Uh, we can't move knickknacks anymore. It's just it, it, the less things we have our hands on, That's right. the better it is for everybody. Uh, now I understand that we're going to have to move some items. I get that, but we want to we want to touch as little as we can in the house. And of course, when we leave, we want to make sure that house is clean for that customer. Why? Because the more they have to clean, obviously, the more that they 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 the less faith they end up having in the installer. So as it changed, it's given us some opportunity. It, it's, it's given us some opportunity to um, to uh, uh, we'll say change what we do a little bit. But, but also it gives us an opportunity to, to strengthen what we need done by a customer. Because these are things, a lot of these things we've been asking for all along. Yeah. And, and, and we've never been able to get. And COVID's given us that opportunity to ask for it and use the government to help. Yeah, and you just have to communicate it ahead of time. Uh, That's correct. So very they, important. Uh, very important, the same message comes from the store that comes from the installer mm -hmm. about what's going to happen inside their, inside their home during the, during the job. It always was important, but now, but now it seems like we have to really drive it home. Yeah. All right, Robert. Yeah, and I and I think again it comes down to that checklist. I think obviously COVID they needed to add a, several items to the checklist that the sales staff needs to go over, you know, with the consumer prior to the installers coming in. The commercial side, you know, you would think, well, it's a large commercial job site. How could it? How could the COVID have such an impact? But it's had a lot of impact on the commercial side. You know, it's, uh, <clears throat> if you take large commercial sites where, you know, you may have 50, 100, 200, you know, construction workers working on a site. Now all that is restricted. I know, because we, again, we have commercial contractors, residential contractors that are members of CFI, and we have had a lot of conversations. And some of them now have to work a day shift versus a night shift. Uh, you have to show up at seven o'clock in the morning, get your temperature taken. Uh, if you show any sign of temperature, they're not gonna let you on the job site that day. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that have uh, really impacted the commercial business. And I think probably long-term it's going to be much more of an impact than it will on the residential side. Cool. So um, I, I got a comment down here. I'll just mention that there is one person who said that flooring dealers need to get out of the installation side. They don't need to be involved. And there are some in, uh, dealers who have gone that route that have turned the installation over to the customer to determine what needs to happen. There are some flooring re retailers that have begun to understand that it is a good profit center and it's a way to cause a security relationship between the customer and yourself because you can do it all. You take one more headache away from them. So they're both of those flavors. Well, they, do you mind, Scott, for just, that would be very bad for installation. It would. Because installers inherently aren't good businessmen. And so what you get is installers all running around the world working for two dollars a yard, yeah. And therefore they don't can't afford their own supplies, and and the, the jobs will stop getting done correctly. Yeah, uh, it, 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 I, I would implore yeah. that that not happen. Yeah, that, that's great advice, David. I think you know, part of what you're saying is that the training really does matter, and part of what we need to be training is business acumen. We need installers to understand how to control and handle their finances. I know it's part of what CFI does in their training is making sure that people have more than the hand skills, but they also understand how to potentially run their own business, that that's, that's part of it. Guys, I hate to rush ahead, but I know we're past time and we're losing people. I just want to answer this question that came up. Uh, this is from Lou Ann Thompson, and she said, on the topic of finding new installers to train, what I really want to know is what is the WFCA doing to direct information to young people out there who may not even know that floor covering is a viable trade. How do we get that information out there? There are a couple of things we're doing. One of them, Robert could speak to if I gave him time and we could speak on it for an hour and that's Build My Future. It's a program that they have developed along with the Build My Future organization. They do a Build My Future flooring where they actually get high schools to send people that are interested in working with their hands out to, to experiment, to actually touch and feel what they can do with the installation side of flooring. One of my favorite quotes Robert gave me is from a lady who brings a group of students out there and she says, 
I've walked on this all my life. I had no idea it was actually a profession, that there were people that did this for a living, put flooring in. We've got to make them aware. Listen, this is a pet peeve of mine. If you watch my Leadership Live uh, webinars that come out, you'll hear me tell, say this a lot, but we have got to get better at telling our story. You're looking at two guys on the screen that are amazing successes because of what's possible through this trade installation. They've been, had ups and they've had downs, but they would tell you they're faithful to the industry and they're thankful for the opportunity that's been given to them. We don't tell that story well. So one of the things we've done is we've recorded some people that have had success and we're sharing that video with guidance counselors across the United States so they can begin telling the story to students earlier in their high school careers while they're making the decision about what they want to go into. But probably the biggest thing we're doing right now is we've gone together with a lot of other entities and formed an organization called the Floor Covering Education Foundation, the FCEF. Robert is a member of the board of that. I'm, I'm the chairman of the board for that organization. The whole focus of that organization right now is bringing new blood into the installation trade. We want new people coming in. And so I couldn't give you, we don't have time for me to go into the list of all the things that we're doing, but let me tell you this. The WFCA made a million dollar commitment to bringing installers into this trade. We have committed a million dollars to do it. And I'd like to thank several members of, of this industry. Major manufacturers came in and said, hey, listen, if WFCA is doing it, we're doing it too. And so they have stepped up and we've gotten multi-million dollar commitments to help solve this problem. It's not enough. There's so much more that needs to be done. We want our scholarship people that are going through training so that they don't bear the brunt of the cost. We want to guarantee job placement at the end and we're working on all those things. We're working with Goodwill right now on a program that would allow us to work with them to place people into a trade where we can train them and they can have a viable occupation. We've got a couple of other pilot programs going on as well. You will begin to see us better communicate what we're doing and the things that we're doing so that you can know uh, this is a passion of the WFCA association should be about solving the problems of the industry. There is no bigger problem in this industry, there hasn't been for the last 50 years, than the installation issue. Whether it's the lack of installers or the lack of quality installers, we are passionate and committed to solving this problem and we will begin to do a better job of communicating to you what we're doing in that regard. Guys, with that said, and I think, I hope I've covered every question, let me just make sure one last time. Hey, Scott, while you're looking at that, uh, I just want to let the group or the audience know, you know, if they get any other questions or have anything whatsoever, they can certainly reach out to us here at CFI. Uh, they can go to our website, probably the easiest, cfiinstallers.org. Uh, there's a phone number if you want to call in. You can email us in. If you have any questions that haven't been answered, we'd be more than happy to, to help you out in any way we can. And there are a couple of other questions that got put in here. And so guys, we'll send those to Dave <coughs> and ask them to respond to those and see if we can post those on our website as well. Um, Lewis, I'll ask you if there's a possibility that maybe we can post this not only on the WFCA website, but also this webinar on the CFI website as well, if that's possible, we'll do it. I wanna reach out to our brothers on the CFI side and tell you that next week is really for you. We're gonna have retailers coming on and we've really, we searched high and low to make sure we have the right panel of experts that can share their expertise with you. I'm bringing Tom Jennings back out of semi-retirement to share with you, nobody has more experience in speaking both of these languages than Tom Jennings. He's a dear friend to all of us and he'll be sharing part of his expertise with you. And we've got a couple of retailers that are coming on that started as installers and they drank the Kool-Aid and swung to the other side, but they'll be sharing their story with you and uh, obviously having compassion on you as you're going through some of the challenges presented by COVID. Uh, we, we thank you for being on the call with us today. The challenge is please be safe, be careful, and um, do all that you can to pay it forward. Be thankful for what you got and uh, make a difference. If you have other suggestions for us, not only on uh, this topic, but other topics you'd like to see us address, please reach out to me at S Humphrey at wfca.org, that's S Humphrey, H-U-M-P-H-R-E-Y, at wfca.org. Hey, Dave, thank you very much. Robert, thank you very much. Look forward to you guys being participants next week and watching as we, we drill a couple of other people and let them share their expertise. God bless you all. Have a good one. Thank you.